Chiffon cakes are known for their light texture. They contain a high ratio of whipped egg whites, which inflate during baking, giving it a delicate and airy crumb. And if you're a fan of the cakes they sell in Chinese and Korean style bakeries, well, this is as close as I've come to replicating that. My husband and his family grew up eating these cakes, and whenever I make them, extra points with the in-laws. You may have seen chiffons baked in two pans, which are tall and have these huge holes in the middle. And these pans are shaped like that to help with even heat transfer. So I went to work developing a chiffon that could be baked in all kinds of pans, yet had that airy texture. The one I'm showing here is a vanilla chiffon that I filled with balsamic strawberries and chopped mangoes. I then topped it with honey whipped cream frosting. First thing up is to prepare my eight inch, not nonstick pans. I believe these are aluminum. I'm gonna bake two layers that I'll slice in half to give me four thinner layers of cake. And all I'm going to do is line the bottoms with parchment paper, but I'm not gonna butter or oil the sides at all. To get the most height from this cake, you're gonna need for the cake to stick to the sides. It sounds counterintuitive, but the cake doesn't have the internal structure to support itself like other kinds of cakes. Now I'm going to mix all the liquids together. So I've got a measuring cup and in goes the room temperature milk, canola oil, egg yolks, and vanilla extract. I'm going to need those egg whites for the meringue later, so I'll separate those into another clean bowl. Initially, the liquids will be divided into two phases, the oil on the top and the water-based ingredients or the milk on the bottom, but the egg yolks have a molecule in them called lecithin that join oil and water together. When you whisk this together with a fork, you're gonna see the two phases mixed together and not separate. Once that happens, it's okay to set it aside. Now for the dry ingredients. Over a large bowl, I'm going to sift in the cake flour, corn, or potato starch, white granulated sugar, and baking powder. Cake flour is more finely milled and contains less of the gluten-forming proteins than all-purpose flour. Using corn or potato starch, which contains no gluten-forming proteins at all, lessens the total amount of those proteins in the cake. And both of those things ensures a very fine and tender crumb that is characteristic of chiffon cakes. Next, I'll add in the salt and whisk this for about 30 seconds to evenly distribute the flours and baking powder. Next, I'll make a well in the middle of that flour and whisking the entire time, pour the liquid in from that first step into the middle of the well. You can see how a little bit of flour gets incorporated every time I whisk. That's so we don't have a lumpy batter in the end. And once all of the liquid has been added, you're gonna whisk a few more times to incorporate the flour and just set that aside. Next, I'm going to grab a small bowl and pour in some more granulated sugar to prepare for my meringue step. The final texture of the cake is entirely dependent on getting this part right. So I'll try to be as thorough as possible. Okay, I grabbed the bowl that I cracked my egg whites into and now goes in the cream of tartar. You can use a stand mixer, but I'm using a hand mixer with the whisk attachment and I'm going on medium high speed. The mixer is unraveling the egg white proteins in the long strands that trap in air bubbles. As we whip it, the bubbles are going to get smaller and smaller and we want these bubbles to be a small size because that's going to give our cake an even velvety fine crumb. Now when the foam looks like this, kind of like a men's homemade shaving cream, it's time to add in the sugar. I do a couple of teaspoons at a time and just eyeball it. There's no need to be precise, but you do need to wait a little bit of time between pours to allow the sugar to dissolve. Egg whites are almost 90% water. The sugar dissolves in there, creating a kind of syrup that surrounds or stabilizes those tiny bubbles that we're making. Now, once all the sugar has been added, keep beating until you get stiff peaks. Now, what does that mean? You can look at this one here and see how it kind of the point droops over. That means that we need to keep going a little bit more. The bubbles aren't fine enough. Once your peaks looks like this, when you hold the whisk upside down, you're good to go. Now I'm gonna grab my bowl of batter and I'm going to fold in the meringue, starting with a small amount from the spatula. This first part is just lightening up the thick batter with a bit of the meringue, so I usually just whisk it in. To start the official folding, take about one third of the meringue and then plop that into the bowl. Then I just use the spatula to scoop up some of the batter from the sides of the bowl and then onto the center where the meringue is. I also so cut through the middle of the batter and scoop it over the center. I just alternate this and I keep repeating this process while rotating the bowl until I don't see any more streaks of meringue. After that, I add the second third of meringue, fold that in, and then the last third. When it's done, it should look like this, lighter in color, doubled in volume, and noticeably lighter in texture with no visible streaks of meringue. I went ahead and poured this batter into my eight inch pans. The pans then go into an oven that's been preheated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit 
Fahrenheit for about 30 to 35 minutes. Now you have to watch the last five minutes of the baking process. The cake will have risen during the last half of the baking, but when it's finished, the cakes will deflate slightly. Only after you see the slight decrease in height is the cake really done. These cakes that I'm showing here are baked properly, but let me show you what happens if you underbake. Looking at these cakes, you'd think they were done. They have a beautiful dome top with some caramelization, but then I let them cool slightly on the counter and they start to deflate. A little deflation is okay if the cakes are flat at the top, but once they start to concave inwards or pull away from the sides, that's a sign of underbaking. The crumb has not properly formed and is not able to support the shape of the cake. Now let's go back to the cakes that I baked properly. I've got two pans here, so I'm gonna show you cooling right side up versus upside down. Chiffon cakes traditionally are cooled upside down. This allows them to stay light and fluffy without the weight of gravity pushing down on the cake. And because we didn't oil the sides of the pan, the cake shouldn't fall out. Once the pans are cold enough to handle, I remove the cakes and wrap them to prevent moisture loss. The cakes are actually still a bit warm when I do this. And here's the cake that I cooled right side up. And you can see that it's got a flat surface, but it's got a little bit of a wrinkled top. In my test runs, I found that this didn't really have a negative impact on the inner texture of the cake very much. The cake that cooled upside down never ceases to amaze me that it's still stuck in the pan, number one. Number two is a little bit higher, though I am using only a two inch high pan. And if you use a three inch high pan, you might see a little bit more loftiness with this cake. Mangoes and strawberries are in season here in March in California. So I chopped up some mangoes after feeding my little fruit goblins and marinated some strawberries in sugar and balsamic vinegar. I also made my honey whipped cream frosting, which if you're interested, I have another video on how I stabilize whipped cream frosting for cakes. So I had no idea how I was gonna decorate this cake before filming. Recently, I've been into slicing my cakes into thinner layers, especially for whipped cream frostings. I just feel like I can use the same amount of filling and there's less pressure on the frosting that will squeeze out of the sides of the cake if it's not as tall. I also like cutting the fruit into bite-sized pieces so when you're ready to cut the cake it's easier to slice without mauling the entire cake and it's also easier for the person to enjoy. This was an amazing cake but there are a few things that I changed the next time around. The cake although it was still very moist is a touch on the drier side due to the ratio of egg whites. It was only really noticeable to me because I bake so much but a flavored sugar syrup would go really well with this cake. I think this also had to do with the fact that I used mangoes, which relatively is a drier type of fruit. The strawberries did help a little bit, but I'd also add some sort of juicier fruit for the filling. And I love the balsamic strawberries. I only added a splash, but I would actually do a little bit stronger on that flavor element for this cake. Hmm. 